history is kind of interesting. And what I think is interesting about history is when you study history and you haven't lived through that history, it's a whole different ballgame because history then becomes what you've been told that that was. So now we have, in particular, the Mon Valley, which is the valley I grew up in. And I think it's very interesting if you think, if you start in the south side, down where that big German beer hall is, and you go across the river on 2nd Avenue, that was all mills. And those mills all the way, all the way down to Sandcastle, okay? And then, where you had that beautiful, wonderful mall with, with sacks. That was a mill, that was all the mill. Homestead was all the mill, and it went along and along and along. And then it became, uh, you, Kenny would interrupt it, and then it was Duquesne, and then it was Clareton. And then you went for a while, and you went for a while, and then you had Denora, and you had Manesson. And there were miles and miles and miles of mills, which meant there were huge amounts of people that had jobs. Now, I can't really speak too much for the other valleys, but I'm sure the Ohio Valley and the Allegheny Valley also had mills. And it was interesting because recently I saw uh, one of Tony Booth's films, Lightning Over Braddock, and one of the main thrusts of the film was you know, these mills are all going to close. And I remember during that point, at time in history, like, Oh man, they'll never do it. You know, we're, we're going to get together and we'll stop it. Well, as you can see, it happened. So, if you could carry anything with you this evening, especially if you're you didn't grow up in the valley or you aren't old enough to remember when there were mills, try to remember that this was a town of mills. This was a town of jobs, and um, it's really nice to know that we now all participate in a service economy. And, um, you know, it's really nice to be a waiter. So, moving on. <laughs> um, this next gentleman last year gave us a, 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 a sort of a lecture on Burke, on, on um, Berkman, I mean on uh, Frick. And this year he's uh, decided to give us a little lecture on uh, Berkman. And, um, and then later on he's going to do a, a, a musical piece. David Hart, give, give us a hand for David Hart. Hey. Um, good to see you tonight. Um, fewer words will come out of me that are written on these pages, I hope. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Alexander Berkman and his motivation, why he did what he did, and, and kind of the milieu in which he, he committed his act. So we should start with the definition of anarchism, which is basically a philosophy thinking that the state is unnecessary, harmful, undesirable, uh, American anarchism lumped in business with that, that big business is, a, is a, you know, an extension of the state. And um, uh, good reason for this feeling for most of history, before um, city-states and the like, uh, human society was organized on anarchist principles, primarily. Um, now, how does anarchism work? Uh, in, in modern times, uh, Pierre Proudhon uh, is considered the founder of modern anarchist theory. And he said, uh, had his famous uh, little epigram, property is theft. So that's one of the fundamental tenets of anarchism. Uh, in this country, anarchism took root um, in the West very quickly, in fact, uh, around mining, uh, railroads. Uh, so it, it's interesting that it actually, uh, modern labor began more in the West than in the East. Um, so but we, we'll skip over all that. We'll get about the 1880s or so which is when Alexander Berkman emigrated to the United States from Russia. And there was a guy in, in this country called Johann Most, who was uh, the most famous uh, kind of public anarchist at the time. And he, he, he basically said that um, uh, we need propaganda of the deed. And I think he said that. But, but the idea is that propaganda of the deed is, is like uh, uh, violence for, by example, that you do this thing and then people are going to take up the you know, regicides, tyrannicides, that you can overthrow society by, by selected acts of violence. And so, but, but most had other ideas that I think were perhaps a little bit more realistic and in fact prescient, uh, talking about the um, free cooperation uh, from each according to his capability to each according to his need. Um, I mean, that certainly is uh, something that we've taken on in part. But, but in its most extreme manifestation, anarchism is quite politically naive in that you can't create an anarchic state 
without breaking everything, right? And so working within the existing structure is really the path of least resistance, and that's why anarchism and its various manifestations never really took root, whereas more kind of, uh, you know, socialistic and communistic things did. Yeah, what? I'm an anarchist. Good, well, how many, how many are anarchists? Still what? 15%? Okay. But we can discuss this. Anyway, Berkman, his Uncle Maxim, uh, was, was the guy that kind of got Berkman going. Uncle Maxim was not a fan of the czar, and um, Berkman figured that out when you know, something happened, there was an assassination attempt on the czar, and Uncle Maxim was you know, very happy and dancing around. And so Berkman was raised on his uncle's knee, and he came to the United States, um, and at the time, the big issue was the Haymarket bombing, very quickly, and that was this big, uh, the bomb blast in Chicago, and the perpetrators, allegedly, alleged perpetrators were found and uh, kind of you know, lynched, basically, or, or you know, something like that. And it was a very, it caused celebra among the, um, the leftist community. And so at the time, that was kind of the, 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 um, the motivation for uh, a lot of the, a lot of the you know, foment going on at the time. And Berkman comes and he gets under most and he gets all upset about Haymarket. He starts agitating and making speeches and going out. And about this time he meets Emma Goldman who is uh, like, you can't talk, tell Berkman's story without Emma Goldman. She was his lifelong friend and kind of uh, um, foil, if you will. So uh, Goldman and, and Berkman meet. Uh, they go to see Mo Most speak, Johann Most, this philosopher, the same night. And this lifelong friendship is cemented. And, and he talks about the propaganda of the deed again. And, and uh, uh, Emma Goldman's transformed. She becomes this firebrand public speaker from being a very modest housewife and, and begins uh, becoming very popular and very successful. And um, she and Berkman, Berkman is like, you know, giving her information. You know, she's feeding her th thinking. They're working together on this thing. They become lovers. It's a very um, kind of passionate start. And, and when they get together, they start thinking, well, now what can we do? And this is now a year or so later, a couple of years later, they, they've been kind of making the circuit and very popular and talking about the anarchist cause. Um, and uh, uh, the Homestead Strike comes along. This is now 1891, one or two, something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And so they, they cook up this thing that they're going to have the, the attentat, the, the, the uh, propaganda of the deed, and they're going to go and, and the, it was basically a lockout, and that they could get, the, you know, could get movement in the lockout and force the company or force things to change by assassinating Frey. And so uh, it was kind of a klutzy attempt. Um, first, uh, they built a bomb, and the bomb didn't work. Uh, like, and, and so they were kind of fussing around. You know, so then they had a plan B. And they, uh, you know, uh, go, or, or rather, um, uh, Berkman got a pistol, and um, you know, off he goes to Pittsburgh. Meanwhile, uh, Goldman, in order to fund the thing, this may be apocryphal, but but I'll, I'll read it anyway. Um, she decided, musing on the character of Sonia in *Crime and Punishment*, that she would become a prostitute in order to support her um, proletarian brothers and sisters. Um, once in the street, she caught the eye of a man who took her into a saloon, bought her a beer, gave her $10, and told her she didn't have the knack, and told her to quit the business. <laughs> she was too astounded to speak, so she hit up her relatives instead, raised a little bit of money. They send Berkman off to Pittsburgh. He buys a suit. Um, he, come, he, he goes to Frick's offices, posing as a manager of scabs. So he says to Frick, you know, I can, ba you know, I can basically help you break the strike. We can bring scabs in. You know, great deal. Frick agrees to see him. In he marches. You know, pulls out his pistol. Bang, bang, bang. Again, a bit of a clutch. He can't kill him with three shots. He has a dagger with poison on it. He jumps on him. You know, Frick, I'm sure, trying to get away. Stabs him in the leg. And, um, and, and, and then Frick's associates come in. You know, the workers, supposedly, they overpower Berkman. Again, this may be apocryphal, but apparently Frick's, you know, they said, should we just kill him? They were going to, you know, just, you know, off him on the spot. And Frick says, no. You know, it's just a trifle. It's another one of these, you know, tiny gnats. I'm going to go back to work, which he did the remainder of the day, and you know, <laughs> let him go rot in jail. I don't care. He's not worth, you know, spending your bullets on. So off goes Berkman to jail, and um, you know, much to their dismay, as the poem alluded, uh, the proletariat did not rise up. The press was against the act. The unions were against the act, and so poor um, Berkman took the fall. 
And he didn't, um, he kept Emma's role a secret, so she basically stayed free. But while he was in prison, she, she did this long list of, of things. Um, she incited, again, the overthrow of property rights. She was an inspiration to the guy who assassinated McKinley. She became a nurse. She spoke out about the Russian Revolution. She published uh, you know, her magazine. And then finally, 14 years later, out comes Berkman from jail, where he was at the Allegheny County, County Jail. And uh, they briefly tried to get back together, but it didn't quite work that way. Um, uh, the, the, when she, she, she described herself as seized by terror and pity at his gaunt appearance. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but within you know, a year or less, she was taken up with the, um, this guy who was a doctor slash hobo, Ben Reitman, who, who became her kind of uh, her boyfriend, and, and, um, and, and Berkman as well. He had an affair with a 15-year-old anarchist, so they kind of strayed their separate ways, but remained friends and were very much attached to each other, and, and he became the editor of her magazine while she went out on the lecture circuit. And so the, the litany of, of, uh, of causes continues. There was the Ludlow strike in Colorado, uh, which where their associates actually built another bomb, which blew up in an apartment, killing like four or five people. What, what year are we talking about? Here? That's 1913 now. Um, so, so there were several people killed in this, in this bomb. Uh, and Berkman promptly started a magazine, The Blast, which I thought is. is <laughs> um, she and her, she and her boyfriend, Emma and her boyfriend, were sent to prison for campaigning in favor of birth control, another forward-looking reform. Uh, but then along came World War One, and um, basically they became anti-war activists. Uh, Her Herbert Hoover caught wind of the of, of them, not Herbert Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, sorry. Uh, caught wind of them and uh, basically got them in, thrown in jail uh, around 1917. They stayed there for a couple years and they were deported to Russia. Um, on the eve of their deportation, Berkman and Goldman were told the news of Henry Clay Frick's death. Uh, asked for a comment by a reporter, Berkman said Frick had been deported by God, which I thought was also <laughs> very <interesting. laughs> Uh, they went to Russia, quickly became disillusioned that the revolution, you know, was really a mess. And they sat and had a, a famous meeting with Lenin. Uh, they asked Lenin, you know, and Lenin asked him all about the U.S. and the prospects for revolution there. And they asked, they asked him, well, what about free speech in Russia? And he said, that's a very bourgeois notion. We're attacked from all sides. And here you're talking about free speech. When the revolution is out of danger, then we can indulge in, indulge in free speech. So, um, Basically, by this time, you know, uh, they wanted out. They left Russia, wrote a big book exposing the, the revolution and all, all of its terror. Uh, and then the end game, they kind of uh, la spent their last 10 years living kind of apart, but in correspondence with each other. And uh, then Berkman died in 1936, or thereabouts, and Emma about five years later. So. Uh, no Packard's next, I believe. Oh, okay. This is a good introduction. Um, the other day, I think you know, if you're going to run for Senate, you've got to get a catchy name, and I think it should be given Hell Mail Packer, uh, because you know, I'm listening to the radio the other day. You know, and this um, this Kappa kid that got beat up by the cops in his neighborhood, which just happened to be Homewood. I knew the kid. He went to school with my son, and believe me, this kid's the last one causing anybody any problem, and these cops really beat him up pretty bad. Well, I guess they have this civilian motor, the boards, you know, that's supposed to, and the mayor's trying to, you know, load it up with his friends, and so I hear Mel come on the radio, and he just, like, you know, gave him hell. It was, it was great to, to know two things. One, he was giving the right people hell, and it wasn't me that was getting it. So tonight I'm going to give the platform to Mr. Mal Packer, who's running for Senate. Give him a big hand. For those of you not familiar with that case, that's the Jordan Miles case, who um, was a young man from Kappa, who basically the three cops made his head look like a soccer ball after they kicked him around. and. Uh, it's being investigated now, but of course the mayor is trying to stack, stack the Citizens Police Review Board so they end the investigations into that and the G20. <coughs> so, I'm not a very good extemporaneous speaker. I usually speak for little cards here, so I'm just going to refer to some of these occasionally here. Uh, one of the things I have to do is apologize to Steve. Um, 
because I was supposed to hang a bunch of posters around town and Steve only made it a couple places. And this is the um, first time I'm announcing this. I was actually called out of town for a little while. Don't ask me how I got selected, but um, some community leaders were selected to go down to Washington because Obama wanted to show us the change that he made and give us our change. <laughs> and I got dollar ten. I got dollar eighteen. <laughs> Unfortunately, the uh, quarters didn't work in change machines, so I suspect it's counterfeit, like most of the change we got. So here you go, folks. There's your change. <laughs> You know, this morning I picked up the New York Times, and I'm going to read you a little bit that I found in the New York Times. This is the business page, of course, and here's what we have. UPS citing strong, strong performance raises outlook, a 57% increase in domestic profit. AT&T increased profit 26%. 3M increased profits 43%. Caterpillar, the famous Caterpillar that makes bulldozers that roll over Palestinian homes and destroys Palestinian the people who defend Palestinian rights, like Rachel Corey, rose 91% in the second quarter. Sales grew 31%. Somehow there's some mystery there about how you can make profits go up 91%, sales go up 31%, so that means they screwed their workers, like every other corporation is doing. This is recovery for the rich folks, and not for us. And this is the capitalist version of anarchy. No rules, no regulations, no oversight. Screw everybody. Just make a hell of a lot of money. They also announced last week that the members of the New York Stock Exchange in the year 2009 made more profit than they ever made in history. The biggest year ever. Poor Alexander Berkman. He wouldn't know which way to shoot. There's so many of these bastards that need to be gunned down, he wouldn't know which way to go. So, People have asked me why I'm running for the U.S. Senate, you know. Um, it's not because I'm a glutton for punishment. I don't particularly like standing out on sidewalks asking people to sign a petition. And for those of you who haven't signed the petition to get us on the ballot, we have one more week to try and collect a lot of signatures. If I don't get enough, we're not on the ballot, and that's just the way it goes. But we're going to keep trying. So see me before you go if you haven't. And it's not because I'm particularly looking forward to climbing into my car every morning and on my own money, and some donated money, we don't get a whole hell of a lot, driving all over the state, talking to strangers and trying to convince them that they should vote for a candidate who has no possible chance of winning, but that they should vote their principles. Um, and I tried to think about how I can explain that, and I wrote something instead. So I'm going to read this to you about why I'm running for office. You know, running for elect elected office is seen by many as an exercise in futility. Some people are quick to remind us that we cannot possibly compete against corporate sponsored candidates of two major parties. Think about that, by the way, corporate sponsors. Candidates take an incredible amount of gifts from corporations. These are called donations. They also have an incredible amount of money spent on lobbying. Here's one quick small example. The Marcellus Shale Drillers, that's what fracking is about, right? The Marcellus Shale Drillers in the state of Pennsylvania alone gave, spent $4.2 million in lobbying fees since 2007 for our legislators. In most nations of the world, that's called bribery. If you walk up to a politician and hand them $100,000, it's called bribery, and we condemn it. In this nation, it's called lobbying and it's perfectly legal. So my response is always that I'm not running against them, but for something, for the right of working people to be heard, for the rights of working people to be championed in a system that already rewards the rich far more than it rewards most of us. We have been led to believe over and over and over and over again that we must vote for the lesser of two evils every few years, and that will solve most of our problems, and we need to put our trust in those individuals to speak for us despite the massive corporate contributions. And many people, and perhaps some of you even, will argue you need to vote for the lesser of two evils. And what you, you justify that by saying to me and to others, but I'm not voting for them, I'm voting against them. When you go in that ballot box, you find me a place where you can click off on, I'm voting against somebody else. It doesn't say that. It says you're voting for that person. And if that person is perpetrating evil on the working class in this world, you're voting for those policies. When you click that button or push that button or click a lever for that person who you see as the lesser of two evils, you're making a moral choice to say, please continue doing so. And I want you to think real hard about that. History has shown us that change doesn't come by trusting the lesser of two evils, but by building mass movements to force leaders to listen to our needs. 
that goes back to our union movement, it goes back to our civil rights movement, it goes back to women's movement, gay movements, disabled movements, all of the movements that many of us have fought for in the world. Think of those four kids, you probably don't remember this, or probably didn't read about it. In 1958, June 19th, just a few days ago, and that would have been, what, the 52nd anniversary, four black teenagers walked into a drugstore in Wichita, Kansas, and they sat down at the counter and said, I want to be served. The chain was the Dotham, I believe, drugstore chain. And day after day after day, three or four days a week they went in there, and day after day they refused to be served. Cops chased them away once or twice, but they didn't arrest them. For some reason, it was not against the law. They sat there. After about a month or so, a 40-year-old white guy walked in, stood there, looked at them, looked at the manager, and said, serve them. I'm losing too much money. It was the owner of the Dockham chain, because they persevered, because they did it, because they had to do it. It was their moral responsibility. That's how that got started. You don't hear about those things. But people are doing those things every day of their lives. And it's important that we do those things, and a lot of that came mass movements. We need to build mass movements and force our elected officials to defend our rights and demand the new era of justice. And I run as part of that movement, not because I believe that electing somebody makes any difference in the world, but because we need to build movements of people that recognize the limitations of trusting the electoral system and realizes the need for all of us to become more active and demand accountability no matter who's elected. And I run to help, I run for the Ron Gulas of the world, the Stephanie, I forget her last name, Holowitz, and the Debbie Borowitz. These are all the people whose lives are being destroyed by Marcella Shale right now. If you're following the struggle and all these people losing their farms, losing their water, having to move off their land. We got an email a couple of days ago from a woman who said, can anybody help find homes for these people? They're living on land, they didn't lease their land but they can't live on it anymore because of Marcella Shale drilling. And that's what's happening here. We run for those people. We run because of what's gonna happen in the state and what's happening in states across the nation. We run for people who've forgotten that our collective voices are far more powerful than those of the mightiest corporations. I'm not a leader or savior, folks. I'm just one angry voice among millions of us who want to see a better world for all of us and a system that can be made to work for us. The present system doesn't work. It's crashed, folks. The empire is done. If you think we're going back, you're wrong. It's never going to happen again. We'll never see what we saw before. We need to make this nation a nation where we understand that we have to be partners in the world and not a bully of the world, where we understand that we all live better when we all live better. Those who have power will continually try to persuade us that we'll all do better if we let the rich get richer and trust them to trickle down. And if anything, we've seen that that hasn't worked. They just continue to get richer. They're thieves. They have no morals. They have no ethics. They take it and they run. They don't create jobs. They don't do a damn thing for any of us. It's a lie. And recent history has proven it so. We live in a country where one out of eight Americans are on food stamps. One out of four children. Education system shot to hell. We now account for greater than one half of the world's military budget. We have spent one trillion, 19 billion on wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, Pakistan, and who knows where else. And we haven't gotten anything out of it except to make some corporations rich with privatized wars. We support a guy in Afghanistan named Hamid Karzai who probably controls, controls 10 square blocks if he's lucky. Everywhere else he's hated. And his brother is the biggest drug dealer. His brother runs all sorts of crooked corporations. His brother's on the payroll of the CIA and rents buildings to the CIA. In addition, the Secretary of Defense in Afghanistan has a son who graduated from Georgetown or GW, I forget which, as the valedictorian and a Rhodes Scholar who got a $360 million contract from the US government to, to run a transportation company. He didn't own a truck. He didn't even have a company licensed in Afghanistan. This is the kind of corruption we're supporting. All of us alive, folks. Every bit of us alive. The empire's coming down, and we need to build a new world. It's up to us to do that. It's up to us to build movements. It's up to us to get out there to be active and refuse to accept these lies. It's up to us to begin voting on our principles and not parties and voting for what we honestly believe in, even if that means that candidate loses. We can do anything we want to do. There's two things you always got to remember when you wage struggle, when you try to make revolution. One is you're going to get your ass kicked. And two is you're going to win. Thank you.